Hey everyone, welcome back to another exciting week where we're talking about a very interesting topic. We're talking about faith and fashion, the way in which society influences the way that we look at things. And we're going to talk about and delve into a bit the idea, the concept of faith. And when we're talking about faith here, I mean faith with a capital F. Uh, the idea of believing that the world was created, that, the, that life has a purpose, uh, the essence of the uh, rel a religious outlook, so to speak, or a spiritual outlook, rather. And we're going to delve into it in, um, in the next, um, pr pr about under an hour or so. So let's, uh, let's buckle your seatbelts and have another exciting lesson here today. So for many people... We have to know, and if you look around, you will know this very well, that the word faith with a capital F is a very big block. There's a roadblock to get there. In reality, faith is not related uh, to, to other things that happen throughout our day, in our life experience. Faith is related not only to big things in our life, but if you think about it, faith is, is also related very much with a lot of little things that are part of our every that are part of our everyday life. Most people when they think about faith, they think about the big things, the the life important questions, but the truth of the matter is that faith, the concept of faith finds expression even in some of the smaller things that we're involved with on a day-to-day -day basis. So, nearly everyone um is a believer to to some degree. A believer in something. Okay, B belief exists even in the most hard-headed, rational, non-believers, uh, people who claim that they are atheists or all sorts of other titles that they give themselves. The idea of faith is something that is present among most people. Many of us take pride in our rationality. We think that we base all of our actions on our thoughts and accurate knowledge, verified facts and orderly sorting and sifting of opinions. The truth, however, though, is that nobody is a total non-believer. Nobody is even the one who calls themselves a non-believer, even who the one who denies and, and you know swears up and down that they don't believe. Barely anybody I can, I, that I can think of is truly a non-believer. All of us, except uh, a lot of things on faith. Okay, faith is faith in the everyday common sense of the word uh, is so ingrained in our lives that we we can't do anything without it. We accept what we're taught in school, uh, what we learned on the street. We accept these things as factual uh, without really giving too much thought to them. Most of these things that we that we accept aren't particularly. Uh, they're not only unverified, uh, they're, a lot of the things are unverifiable, yet we still, we, we, there's still a huge part of our lives that we accept these ideas and make them a part of our lives. It's, it's practically impossible to do any real checking about most of the basic things that we, uh, that the most of the facts that we that we encounter, we we don't have the time, we don't have the facilities or the talents to 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 find out for ourselves about most of the things that we say that we know. Okay, we we accept the facts from we accept the facts of what's the height of Mount Everest, uh, right? Even the people who climb Mount Everest don't bother to double check the measurements that when they when they actually make the climb. So we accept, we just accept it when it, when the, the height of Mount Everest is uh, twenty nine thousand and such and such uh, feet high. We just we accept that as as a fact. Who's going to go check? What, 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 we, it's it's not something that we care to look into that we really can look into. Uh, yes, there's ways to measure and there's, but it, it's not something that we dwell on all that much. We we just accept that. Okay, that's that's the way it is. That's how tall it is. Okay, fine. Um, just as we accept facts about cars and electricity, signing contracts and walking in the street, we we take so much for granted. Why? Because we have faith to some degree 
in the car dealer, in the electrician, and in, in even the decent behavior of those people that we encounter. We have faith that they know what they're doing and that they are – when we get onto an airplane, we have faith that the, the pilot who's sitting there went to pilot school and that he passed uh, – Correctly, and that he's not uh, intoxicated, and all, we all, all of these, all of these, 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 these reliances on faith, and this, this really goes into the way that we live our life. We have a certain degree of faith going through our life in the things that we do. Now, what we perceive as the dichotomy between matters of faith and indisputable facts, quote-unquote, has a lot less to do with rationality than uh, what that which is socially accepted within our particular society, within our particular social group, within the historical era in which we were born, in which we find ourselves. What, quote-unquote, everybody knows is something that we don't feel obligated to prove for ourselves. Right? If it's, oh, I just, everyone knows that. Right, so we don't we don't feel the need to break outside the box and try and question that. That's just something that everyone knows. We take it for granted. We take it as a given. We accept it on faith. So for the same reason, those things which are not part of our accepted wisdom are left to the believer. You have to be a believer in order to accept that which is not considered conventional wisdom, the things that everybody knows. There's a, a microbiologist who was doing research in Africa, and uh, he, w he asked a very a young, uh, a bright young uh, local boy to, to run some errands for him. And he tried to explain to the, to the young man the research that he was doing. And he described the, the, the tiny invisible microbes that are all over the room that, the, that, the, that they were standing in and that, that, he, that these microbes that he was delving into, that he was exploring, learning about, were liable to make a person ill or even kill the person. And to that child, the, the child looked at this microbiologist and, and who he had, he had the, the child had been educated by missionaries and he looked at the the microbiologist and said, "But sir, we are Christians, and surely we don't believe in that—that that there are these little microscopic entities that can make people sick and can make people die. In, in some places, the existence of devils is an accepted fact that everybody knows for sure that they exist. No question, right? They for sure exist. In other places, the same frivolous reasons." For the same frivolous reasons, nobody believes them. Nobody believes in the devils. And so while our sets of beliefs are contextual, the underlying nature of faith is the same all around the world. People accept the premise, the worldview, that they have that they already have preconceived. And again, this is based on society. This is based on the historical era in which you find yourself. This is based on all sorts of outside premises that set the paradigms that how you view the world around you. A crisis of faith, whether it's personal or a general crisis of faith, is a result of cultural change. Uh, a large, it could be a large cultural change. It could be a small cultural change. It's a matter of luck. Right in what age a person is born, there there are ages in which faith is the is the natural way in which people live. Right, everybody is a faithful person. Everyone is a believer. Uh, there are ages where it's not fashionable to be a believer. Cultural fashions change no less than the style of clothing change. Cl clothing changes. Okay, and so there there are fashion designers who set the styles for what women's dresses and what men's ties are going to look like. There are also people who create the intellectual, fa the, the intellectual fashion uh, of the times, and they decide what people should and should not believe, what's going to be in fashion to be accepted. Now, while 
we know kind of who makes the rules when it comes to women's dresses and men's ties, right? The, the fashion designers, they kind of set the trends. We usually don't know who's behind the intellectual fact, the fashions of the time. And I don't, I don't, I'm not talking in any sense that there's some sort of conspiracy, that there's a, a man or a group behind the curtain that's sort of setting what the trend is going to be. But these are, these are ideas, these are paradigms that evolve in different ways. But once the paradigm becomes the paradigm, paradigm, and that becomes the trend in which society views things. This becomes the lens in which all things are assessed. So, for example, in the last 30 years, the Nobel Prize for Literature has not had literary significance, right? It's been a forum for political statements of various sorts. Those who distribute the prizes probably have uh, you know, slide rules to calculate up and down who's the up-and-coming person and who's going to get the prize. You have to give to a man, to give to a woman, we have to give to a minority, we have to give to all sorts of different uh, different uh, classifications, quote-unquote, of people. R not, not so much looking at the quality of the literature, but looking at, viewing it that it has to be done in this particular way. And so there are other factors that are going into play rather than the actual literature. And even the ones, even even in the in times gone by, let's say where there where there were times where uh, where the Nobel Prize for Literature was actually gained for was actually given for purely literary reasons. The uh, the list contained a lot of great writers alongside uh, alongside those who whose name nobody remembers. You had ones that we remember today and we still look to today, and then there's ones that nobody remembers. All right, at the time, they received the prize. They were, the, they were at the peak of their fame. And now it's difficult to imagine why anyone even saw value in their work, right? Though it, 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 because it goes against the trends of what's fashionable today. And so in, in, the age of, in an age of faith, people don't air their doubts and their misgivings that they have about faith. Most of them will, will never have doubts, right? Because it's the social norm to believe. In other eras, it's just the opposite. Skepticism is fashionable, and everyone joins in the skepticism. Everyone adheres to an idea uh, that seems understandable and reasonable in their period of history or in the society that they live in. And later, people might look back and wonder how in the world could they possibly have held such an absurd belief. But the idea is that a lot of what we believe or, we, or what, we accept as, uh, what we accept as valid, as reasonable, is molded by the societal lens that we've been granted. It's kind of like putting on uh, we, look, we have a certain worldview, and the worldview that we have colors the way that we see everything. It's kind of like putting on uh, glasses that are tinted red, right? And you look at the world around you and everything looks red because the, the glasses that you're wearing shapes the way in which you see everything. And it works a similar way with worldview. The, when, you, when you view everything through that worldview as that is the reasonable benchmark or starting point, the litmus test, the, this, is the, this is the way, the lens in which everything is analyzed, you will see the things through that particular worldview. And it's not, it's not that one is more reasonable per se than the other, it's that this is the worldview that you've either accepted upon yourself or that's been granted to you by the society that you live in, the historic and, and, uh, and contextual nature of the, what's going on in the culture of that particular time. So not so long ago, we're talking about red-colored glasses, right? There were the red decades, right, of, of European and American history. And it was commonly thought that everyone uh, of any account was a communist, or at least a communist sympathizer, including intellectuals, trendsetters, people who, have, who should have known better, and people who... Who would have? Who you know should have been? Who should have been far more critical? It was it was a period in which people were obstinate believers, persisting in their belief and ignoring any evidence to the contrary. They viewed the world like this, right, with their red tinted glasses, right, communist tinted glasses. Then the fad passed, and now believing in communism seems out of step with the times. For the same wrong reasons that people once believed, 
They now have ceased to believe. Nothing intrinsic has changed, only the fashion shifted. How are we going to view things? Cultural fashions influence not only opinions about art, about morality, about politics. They affect almost every facet of life. Fashion uh, creates what people buy, what people wear, how people decorate their house, what they hang on their walls, right? What it trains them uh, not only to buy these things, but that they should actually enjoy these things. Not only I'm going to buy this particular thing, but I'm going. This is what I enjoy. I, I, I I've been told that this is what is good, what is beautiful, what is what is uh, what you got to have. So the same law of fashion also changes our outlook and attitude about. Um, about matters that seem to be merely uh, utilitarian. So, for, so from furniture to architecture, things are chosen not because it's sensible to do so, but because they are fashionable, because that's what the trend is. That's, what fashion, that's what's in fashion right now. So it, it goes from everything from our clothing to our hairstyles to our worldview. Everything, there's a trend in which we view the world. Okay, so in our times, the cultural rules allow for a certain amount of freedom um, in, in, our, in our choice of what we, you know, you're, you are free to, to believe and do and, and, and uh, buy and, and whatever you'd like. There's nothing stopping you. But people, people naturally have, they, they naturally are drawn to be a participant in the group, in the cultural norms of the society in which they live. No one is controlling them, uh, per se, to to do these things, but this is just human nature, that we want to be a part of the group, we want to uh, accept and view the world as as everybody else does. We don't want to be the odd man or odd woman out. And so in our times, the cultural rules do allow for a certain, a certain amount of freedom, right? There's no one manipulating us in, in, in an outright way, uh, right? In our, in our, what, we, what we consider beautiful, we have the choice to, to choose what we consider beautiful. In other periods, society was much more decisive. There wouldn't have been any disputes as to what's considered beauty, since these were, there was only one accepted style of what was considered beauty, and all other styles were unacceptable. So take, for example, in ancient Egyptian paintings, one of the things you'll notice, interesting thing, uh, that, that if you take a look at some uh, ancient Egyptian paintings, all of the faces of the humans are in profile. Regardless of the stance of the body, the, the face is in profile, right? It's a sideways view. So if, if we didn't know any better, we would think that, okay, I guess the Egyptians didn't know how to draw, right? They were too primitive. However, their drawings of animals are very realistic. It's only the human beings that look stiff and, and uh, unnatural. When, when Egyptian artists were allowed to make natural drawings, they were actually quite good at it. Apparently, certain poses were just the fashion of the art. And those poor artists were obligated to depict people according to the convention. So this adherence to fashion, to what's in vogue, what's in style, can also be found in architecture. There are no arches in ancient Egyptian buildings. It's an interesting thing. It seems kind of strange that people who were quite technologically advanced wouldn't utilize such a functional structure. And as it turns out, the Egyptians did know about arches, and they used them in their sewage canals. So they thought it was beneath their dignity to construct dwellings that had arches. It wasn't the fashion, and so therefore it did not exist. They viewed the world in this particular worldview. So cultural fashion, or the spirit of the times, has such tremendous power that it not only influences philosophy, beauty, and other matters that are uh, other similar things, even modern exact sciences are under its rule. In all sciences, including mathematics, there are periods in which certain uh, questions become more important, more tempting to, to examine, they're fo- which are followed by periods in which these same subjects or methods lie dormant. 
So, for example, the, the furious growth of physics, especially uh, atomic and subatomic physics, in the first half of the 20th century compared to its development in the second half of the 20th century. Uh, the, the enormous growth in, of biology and biochemistry and biophysics in the second half of the 20th century. There, there are trends of what's, what we focus on, what, where there's tremendous growth, and what, which questions we want to explore uh, in the utmost depth, and then it kind of like shifts. right? And so many books have tried to explain these changes and trends uh, throughout everything that we know to be true and what is accepted in society, why they happen and in the ways that they do. However, all of these explanations that have been uh, processed, regardless of whether they're right or wrong, do not contradict the most obvious fact, the change itself. It does happen. In the same way that hairstyles and clothing styles change, Every few years, maybe every decade or so, right? There's there's the '70s style. If, you, if you're wearing bell bottoms, that's you know that that person is fr- is a, that's a picture from the '70s. If if there's a if a, if, a, if you have a Purim, uh, right? A perm, perm, pur, Purim, <laughs> Purim's the holiday. Uh, a perm uh, or or an afro. Uh, you know, th- this these are these are haircuts that were typically styles of the '70s, right? There's there's if you're in if you're in hippie. Uh, if you're in hippie clothes, you know, okay, that's probably a picture from the 60s. Each decade has its, has its trends in clothing, in hairstyles, in design of, of homes and, and, and everything, architecture. And then there are the worldviews as well. Society shapes the way of what we can see. And it's not based on any sort of factual, uh, th- th- nothing, nothing inherently changed, uh, not only in the fashion, but in what's fashionable to believe. Nothing inherently changes over there, just the society shifts. It's a strange thing, but it, it's definitely something that takes place. And so the decades or centuries of belief, they come and go. Right, they're, they're replaced with periods of skepticism and indifference, and then they're by a profound change in the attitudes towards faith that people have. So there'll, there'll be times where it's, of course, I believe. That's just that's just everybody believes, right? And then there'll be periods like, how can you believe, right? We're we're in a, we're in a we're in a period of skepticism. In an age of faith, it's very easy to believe, right? In fact, in such an age, faith doesn't even seem to require belief. Right? In certain times and places, one wouldn't even speak about belief in God. It was, it was a simple self-evident fact. You wouldn't speak about belief, oh, do you believe in God or not believe in God? It was just, that was what, that's, that's an accepted thing. Not believing in God was a little bit more bizarre, right? Than, than, right? It was, it was like, that was like saying the earth, the earth is flat. You know, it, it was something that's like, what? That, that's, that's completely Outside the realm of what is of what is discussed, of what is what is accepted. So generally, we accept the dictates of society, though almost without noticing. We take things for granted. We jump to conclusions. We accept common knowledge uh, and the everyday realities unchallenged. None of the most abstract, uh, none none except for the most abstract philosopher would doubt the existence of his own nose, right? And so in the same way, the, these things that we accept as facts, as our worldview, in whatever form it, it finds itself, we accept that as, as the real, in the same way that I accept the reality of my own nose. And only a deep philosopher, right, an abstract philosopher, would contemplate the non-existence of his nose. But when it comes to faith, with a capital F, right, faith in God and purpose and a higher being, things become more difficult. Many people just cannot accept it. Our times are, are clearly uh, different. Our paradigm is, is not an age of faith. But incidentally, we're also not in an age of rationality or skepticism either. Um, we're, we're, in a, we're, t- we're kind of in a time of, of credulity. Uh, we're, we're in a time of uh, acceptance of anything, either either uh, questioning uh, either questioning everything or, no, or non acceptance, but also kind of accepting everything. We kind of believe it just a little bit, 
right? And I, I noticed a lot of this when when doing the an extensive amount of research for my latest book, which is available at all great Jewish bookstores, the A Jewish Guide to the Mysterious, um, which which goes through the ideas of the paranormal, a, a Jewish look at what's what are the concepts of the paranormal. Now, in in investigating this. I found some very interesting things, right? That people people kind of like half believe in everything. This applies across the board, right? So it's it's a time where people are accepting of things, but people are also like they don't want to commit. We, we we do indeed believe or half believe in thousands of things. Some of them pure nonsense, right? But it, it, pure nonsense except for faith, right? In the, in, in the, 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 the idea or concept they believe in makes no more rational sense than, than the idea of faith or, the, or, or other ideas that they say, well, I'm going to reject because it's not rationally sound. But they'll accept this other nonsense that has the same lack of credibility. So the difference between the two levels of faith, right, faith in conventional wisdom and faith in God is not grounded uh, any psychological disparity, but rather in societal norms. When a person says that he is a non-believer, it's not a very accurate statement. A real non-believer wouldn't get out of bed. If he did get out of bed, he wouldn't take his first step because almost everything that we do depends on hundreds of thousands of beliefs. The belief that the sun is going to rise in the morning, the belief that salt is going to still taste salty tomorrow. Organized religions dictate the doctrines of faith that people are to believe. That at the same time, they also set which is that which is heresy, that which is outside, not to believe. You're not supposed to believe. And when when an organized religion went when when the concept of organized religion went went out of style, and its 19th century substitute science became uh, far less dogmatic, dogmatic and self assured, this opened a oh, this opened a way sort of for people to believe in superstition. A true agnostic is actually open to belief in every possible faith or superstition. He's open because he's right because nothing is completely impossible. That's a true agnostic, and there's no prescribed. Uh, there's nothing that's there's nothing there's no prescribed belief or proscribed beliefs. Right, everything is fair game. Uh, he he's fair game for every movement every ism that comes about, every possibility. Everything is possible for a person who wants proof, especially negative proof, and who will accept or deny claims only based on proof. In a way, the stance leaves the poor agnostic as uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a position in which he never fully believes anything. He can only half believe in everything because the possibilities are endless. So, so it's it's interesting. There's a there's a cute story that someone once came once once came to visit um, uh, Niels Bohr, one of the great physicists of the 20th century, and to his great astonishment, the visitor saw a horseshoe hanging on the doorway. And after some time, when they had become friendly, he asked, you know, Professor Bohr, "Do you believe in horseshoes?" <laughs> And Bohr said, absolutely not. So the visitor asked, then, why do you have a horseshoe hanging on in your doorway? And so Bohr answered, Professor Bohr answered, people say that it helps you even if you don't believe in it. So we all know very sane, very intelligent people who will not go to synagogue or they won't go to church, any house of worship, because there's no proof for the existence of God, but will talk about vibrations or will use crystals to heal themselves or will avoid unlucky number 13 or will consult an astrologer or look at their horoscope in the newspaper. And so to be sure, not, not all intelligent people of, of this day and age um, are prone to New Age superstitions and paranormal beliefs, some people prefer to adhere to slightly different or, uh, or older, uh, superst I don't want to say superstitions, but older uh, belief systems uh, that, that they feel more grounded. So they'll, they'll, they will, again, uh, firmly believe in the, uh, 
the headlines of the New York Times, or they will firmly believe in the wisdom of the theater reviewer, right? What, what, what Siskel and Ebert give the film. That's how they're going to view the film. So the abundance of belief, of reliance on belief, does not include faith in God. Even opening oneself to the possibility of faith requires effort. Modern societal norms are almost like a religion. They compel everyone to belong. You gotta belong. You gotta you gotta fit in with society, right? You don't want to be one of those fringe guys, or like some some conspiracy theorist kook who doesn't who doesn't fall in line with what society uh, thinks at this particular time. You, you're compelled, in, 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 and it's part of our human nature. You're compelled that that every, everyone is compelled to belong, to acquire, or to, to look a certain way, to act a certain way. Society dictates intelligent people don't do or say that. Intelligent people don't believe those things. Remember the expression? There was an expression. It's un-American to do that or to do blank. Right? It's un-American. Well, I, I, I want to be an American. right? I want to be a proud American. It's un-American to do blank. And so that's a way to sort of, sort of cajole somebody into to, you know, fall back in line. Or if if you if you look at something differently, then uh, there's another way to right. You're a science denier. Any anything that anything that's outside because science is the paradigm now. So if if you view things differently, even if you are a scientist, right? It, it's you are a science denier if you going against the uh, paradigms that are set in science for this particular day and age. You're a science, you're a denier, right? Or it's un-American to do X, Y, and Z. So society, there's a, nat- there's a natural desire to fit in with what everyone else believes, and we are sort of uh, confined to that paradigm or that box. In order to extricate oneself from that compelling social web that we find ourselves, a person has to use a fair amount of disbelief uh, an ability to fight, to move against the stream. It takes learning and a choice not to comply with everything that is that is uh, put in your face, and that, that's not an easy thing to do. And again, I'm not I'm not saying that a person should be uh, fighting the streams of society in every on, in every area, but sometimes what society puts value in is not always the thing that we have to put value in. The ability to, to believe hasn't diminished. There's a deep mental gap between the things that people believe in and faith in God. The distinction is not rational. right? We believe in a whole bunch of things, or we're willing to believe a whole bunch of things, or be open to belief in a whole bunch of things. But it, something happens when we, when we mention, or when we think about the idea of God. The distinction is not rational. It's one of perception. Those thousands of things that we normally accept with unquestioning trust are not perceived as requiring faith. This is just considered knowledge or common sense. While faith is required for things that are beyond the accepted norm of the time or society. Faith requires a jump, the the proverbial leap of faith. There comes a point at which we have to jump to a conclusion that's not part of the accepted knowledge. This leap of faith is not easy. Faith with a capital F um, it, right, and is, is much harder than belief in everyday, in everyday events and everyday beliefs because it's, it, has, it has many mental and practical consequences that come along with it. Many things are accepted without question. Why? Because we're not, they're not considered important enough. So, for example, if I ask when Alexander the Great lived, People who remember history will give the dates that he lived, and people who don't, not, won't. But nobody doubts the existence of Alexander the Great. Why not? Why not? The actual proof is, in fact, very scanty. Some stories and books and some antiquities that have been identified as belonging to the era of Alexander the Great. There's circumstantial evidence that may support the idea of the existence of Alexander the Great, but it's not. It's surely not plain as the nose on my face. It's not absolute proof. Why is it then that people have no problem having faith in the existence of Alexander the Great? Well, the reason is very simple. What do they care? What do we care? If Alexander did not exist, 
right? So what? He's just another figure in history that's not entirely true. The existence or non-existence of Alexander the Great has no real consequence in our life. And so it, in, the, in the same way, we accept the facts of, the, of how big this, the area of the Pacific Ocean is. We, as like, okay, well, whatever. It's because it has no real, it has no real relevance no consequence in my life. These beliefs have no consequence. There's no, no matter, no, no matter, they, they don't really matter much whether I believe them or not. Okay, I'll accept it because, like, what, what difference is that going to make in my life? Other beliefs, though, are very demanding. Real faith in important matters has consequences in one's life. It affects one's worldview and one's behavior, what one deems to be right and wrong, what, what one values in their life. This is not a simple, unimportant fact. This is, this is not simple, unimportant knowledge that one can just sort of take or leave at will. If God exists, there are obviously vast implications that come along with that. And as long as people don't know what they believe or are sort of hazy about their belief, which is what most people probably fall into that category, they can do whatever they want without thinking too much about it. I kind of believe, I believe in God, but okay, and then you ask, start, start asking questions about what are, what are the parameters of what, what do you mean that you believe in God? What does that mean to you? Well, as long as I don't think about it too much, it's not, it's not going to have much an effect in my life. And so I'd rather not think about it too much because I don't want the consequences that come with it. Right? People avoid thinking. It's just easier that way. So accepting a tenet of faith is not difficult. The hard part is accepting the attendant consequences that come along with it. There are certain facts that we, you know, that that uh, it's not about. It's not about the belief itself. Okay, do you believe in God or not? Like, like uh, I'm open to the. But if there are consequences that come with that. That's going to shape my worldview. That might influence my diet and my weekend plans. Oh, I better think this through a little bit more because uh, I'm not sure I'm so ready to deal with those consequences. So it's not about the, the actual matter of faith, the belief itself. It's about the consequences that come about from that. The second difficulty in taking the leap of faith, faith F, uh, with a capital F, is that it is indeed a leap. Right? A person has to be willing to decide to make the jump. And people, people don't take the leap unless they're compelled to do so. The compulsion is, is usually an inner drive that's triggered by questions that won't go away. Right? These questions of existence, right? the philosophical existential questions uh, that, that a person might have. So the big questions about existence, about who created the universe and who's responsible for the order of the world are, are compelling for just a few. Not everybody is interested in thinking that deeply into things. Most people, especially city dwellers, not, not anything wrong with being a city dweller, but just, it's just easier to get caught up in a lot of other things when you live in the city, they never even see the stars. They have hardly an interest in lifting their eyes, and when they do, it, what, right, what they see is is a lighted billboard. The questions which bring most people to faith are, in the simplest words, what is the meaning of all this? What is the purpose? These are questions that are that are basically don't have answers unless one is willing to take the leap of faith. Each of us asks our own question in our own way, at our own time. And sometimes questions about ordinary life, right? A person might say to themselves, I have, a, I have a busy life. I do things. I run from place to place. I live. I eat. I go through all the motions. But where am I running to? What is the meaning and purpose of all of this? Then the search for an answer begins. It doesn't have to be some epiphany, some life-changing moments, good or bad. Eventually, this question will begin to gnaw at a person. Even going through all of the trivialities of life. They know what they do. They're busy. They're involved in different things. But then you start reflecting. You take a step back. What? Why am I doing all this again? Walking through life is like walking through a maze. Constantly probing and searching for the, for, for the opening of the maze. Uh, the answer to this riddle of what's the whole purpose of all of this. And it's depressing when we feel that we're not getting anywhere. When we, when we feel that, uh, that we are... We're trying to find the answer to that, but it's not, there's nothing satisfying. 
And it's, there's even deeper despair that comes about when we know that the, the maze, uh, when we come to the conclusion that the maze may have no way out, that one will wander aimlessly from corridor to corridor until their death. We, we, we don't always think about meaning and purpose, but when the situation does come to awareness, it becomes a haunting, gnawing pain. We want, we want a response to our deep existential questions. We want a non-trivial answer to these very deep questions about purpose. We have, we have trivial, temporary answers to many of them. I'm here to make money. I'm here to devour as many hamburgers as I possibly can. Right? Those might be purposes. They're very trivial. They're very non-fulfilling purposes. So the very concept of purpose is essentially actually a religious statement. And the quest for purpose is a spiritual journey. Now, this, this may be an unpleasant releva- revelation for some people, uh, especially ones who are vehemently uh, claiming that they are atheists or they're agnostic, they don't believe in anything. Even people who see themselves as living um, in in a maze without an opening can nevertheless see life as a very dignified existence and uh, an adventure that's filled with danger, with challenge, with beauty, with opportunity to love, to pursue justice, to raise a family, and to, to care for others. The grandeur and the challenge of that kind of existence don't seem trivial at all, even for people who believe that when they die, that that's the end. Right? So that sense of beauty, that sense of grandeur, and the adventure give them a purpose in life. Without using God's name, the person is actually being ve- is very much a believing person with a deep faith that there is a, tran- there, there's a uh, transcendent meaning in life, and that the adventure in life, there's, there's, there, there's an adventure in life, and, that, and to live life in a dignified way. Excuse me. And so this is the essence of faith. It's a, fa- it's a deep belief in things that cannot be proved. I cannot prove beauty. I cannot prove dignity, or honesty, or integrity. Yet I, I may live a life that's filled with all of these things. A person who has non-trivial answers to the questions of purpose and meaning is, in one way or another, speaking about God, even if sometimes, for some inexplicable reason, the person doesn't want to call it that. The atheist who's living a dignified, ethical, and spiritual life is an unconscious believer. If, we were, if he wasn't fighting it so hard, he would realize that he has a formulation for his faith. And if he put it in slightly different words or arranged it slightly differently, it might almost be a well-organized religion. Like, it's, like it says, a rose by any other name is still a rose. And likewise, God by any other name is still God. People might, might, people might say that any question about purpose is an unscientific question. That, that, is, that is indeed so. Uh, science deals with only one part, one kind of uh, of the human question, but its very definition, but its very definition, uh, it it does not and cannot address others. Right? Scientific questions, mathematical questions, legal questions, and shoemaking questions are each addressed a different aspect of reality. The fact that our faith questions cannot be answered with scientific mathematical, legal, or shoemaking answers doesn't mean that they are irrelevant, that they should just be dismissed or looked at as a, a belief, a baseless belief, or unimportant. Right? When someone falls in love, when someone falls in love, the question, does he or she love me, becomes a very important question, an all-consuming question even, one that one might, a person might ponder for hours or days or weeks. It's not a scientific question, but it is a very important question for the people that are involved. It's in the same way that the question, what is the meaning of my running, my rushing, and all the things that I do, the little things, the big things that I do in my life, that is an important question. The fact that science doesn't have a particular answer for it doesn't make it any less important, or that there isn't a, a particular meaning. So questions of faith, 
are not philosophical, sociological, or psychological. They are intensely personal. Everyone has to find his or her way in dealing with these particular ideas. The point at which a person is ready for a change, for a jump, is when the person becomes aware of the existence of the question. Once we become aware of the questions, this awareness pushes us to the brink in which we have to take the leap. This point of choice, the, the leap of faith, is made in a variety of ways. For some people, the moment of the leap of faith is overwhelming. It's an unforgettable experience, like an epiphany. Many more people, the, the vast majority of people, never have an epiphany, they, they, they still have, but they still have faith. And uh, in, in the real life of of humans. Faith is not always a, a tremendous, overpowering, and emotional experience. Some people don't even know that they made the leap, right? They just kind of make a step forward without even noticing, and then they find themselves on the other side. They're a believer. Only if they're introduced, or only if they introduce themselves to introspection, can they perhaps pinpoint the moment that, that, that changed them, that the, if they retrace their personal history enough, they can find that that aha moment. But most people just kind of, kind of flows naturally. There, there's also a, quite a number of unconscious believers, very deep believers, who, who don't like the language, who don't like who, the, the, way, the way that, that faith is commonly expressed. It's much easier for people in certain circumstances or uh, in certain social groups to, to give faith another name. They're, they're, to, to say that they're belie- to attribute their faith, to actually be believers, but to use different l- language or uh, system of description or whatever to to uh, to identify their faith, right? They they live their lives without knowing that they belong to a flock of believers, right? They belong. They're in the flock of believers they're, because they don't define themselves as such. And so for these unconscious believers, the realization that I have faith, and I've always had faith since I was a young child, comes as a shock. It's like, wow, I'm a believer. They're not accustomed to the idea, and they, therefore they, they feel that there's something wrong with them. Although they might be going against the grain of society, they, they are acknowledging that there's a part of themselves that has a very natural, uh, that the they have to acknowledge to themselves this is a very natural aspect of, of existence. In many cases, uh, it's also a matter of probing. There might be more believers outside the, ho- the outside of the houses of prayer than there are on the inside sometimes. And so some people with a very deep faith either don't take to organize religion for one reason or another, they don't agree with any particular theology, or they convince themselves they don't agree with a particular theology because, again, of the consequences that that uh, means for them. So they, they never participate in religious groups or become members of an organized religion. But with all that, faith is neither remote or absolute. Right? To quote the biblical passage in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 12 through 14, it says, It's not in the heaven, neither it is beyond the sea. It is something very near to you in your mouth and in your heart that you may do it. It's just to close, with, as, a, as a Torah-minded person, we're, we're meant to sort of not reject outright the trends and ideas of society. We're not meant to be a, you know, a nation that by default rejects every bit of every element of society, every fashion, every trend, every idea, every everything. We're not just supposed to live... Uh, per se, in a cocoon. At the same time, the lens at which the primary benchmark, the lens that we are meant to view the world through is the lens of the Torah. And it's only through the study of Torah, the involvement of Torah, the ingraining Torah values, Torah ideas, Torah laws, Torah principles into our mind that we can view the world from with the Torah's lens. All of us have a lens. All of us have a worldview. Question is, am I, do I want my worldview shaped by society? Do I want it shaped by my, my uh, subjective feelings? Or is it something that I would like to at least consider the idea that there is a God who created the world with a purpose, and I'd like to look through the world with the purpose that that God uh, created the world uh, to, to exist in? And I want to be a part of that that path in which he that in which he created the world to exist on, and so it's through the study of Torah and us together we do we do this all the time, 
Um, it, it is through the study of Torah, the knowledge of Torah, that we can put on those glasses and go through life with the worldview of, of God, of Hashem, and, uh, and operate in the way in which we were purposed to do so. Uh, so I, I hope that you enjoyed this little discussion. God willing, we will uh, talk again and have, another exci- and have another great lesson very soon. And until then, I wish everyone a lot of blessings, and I will see you, God willing, in the very near future for another exciting lesson. Have a great day, everybody.